going to be like all of the demos. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> the first five seconds of today's video. I know. This is a weird start to lecture, guys. Okay. Um, so for anyone who's watching the video now, I did some I did some fracture tests on and showing the different fracture modes of paper. Um, apologies to anyone who's watching the video later. Oh, oh boy. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. So um, stress concentrations. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so I think this notation is actually flipped from how I had marked it on Monday, but just kind of roll with it. Uh, it's more for the sake of how we define fracture. Um, so now I'm going to define here at the at the root. So so you remember our maximum stress concentration sigma max now is here at the top and bottom edges of that elliptical hole, and this is equal to sigma infinity. 1 plus uh, 2 times a over b. Again, this is this is flipped from what I had on Monday. I'm just it, it's for the sake of fracture. Um, so I'm going to define a new quantity here. For an elliptical hole, uh, I'm going to define some value rho, which is the radius of the of the ellipse at the edge, which we can define to be b squared over a. This is a, a geometry relationship. Um, or geometric relationship. So I can take that row, plug it in. Now say this a over b is also equal to the square root of a squared over b squared, which is also equal to, if I plug this row in, the square root of a over rho. So now I'm going to rewrite my sigma max in terms of rho sigma max is equal to sigma infinity 1 plus 2 square root of a over rho. And now this rho, if as, as this crack becomes sharper and sharper, as rho goes to 0, sharp, sharp crack, as rho goes to 0, then um, dress stress max goes to infinity, which isn't entirely practical. Um, we know that there can't be an infinite stress concentration at a thing, otherwise nothing would survive ever. The smallest tiny crack would just cause parts to catastrophically fail. Um, but this is kind of a useful way of thinking about it. Specifically, I'm going to now say my max stress concentration, sigma max, is proportional to the applied stress times the square root of a. So now I have the square root of a in there. I know as, as rho goes to zero, sigma max goes to infinity, but really it goes to this one term kind of goes smaller. Uh, it goes to sigma infinity to square root of a over rho. But um, I'm going to rewrite that now, ignoring what the radius, the exact radius of the tip is, and I'm going to rewrite it as proportional to the square root of a. So there's a reason I'm doing this, and that's basically, it kind of relates to the history of how fracture mechanics started to be studied. So when we go back, we can go back to about the 1920s, uh, and there was a guy named Griffith. Griffith, uh, he was an aerospace engineer in World War One, so World War One, um, and so around the 1920, around 1921, 1921, yes, 1921, he came out with a paper specifically talking about fracture in glass. So there was this issue. So you'll notice that actually both of these examples are, are wartime examples. Uh, which is fun, but basically they were, he noticed that for glass rods, for glass rods, the, what they saw experimentally, the strength of these glass rods or plates of glass that they were making stuff out of, um, the strength, now I'm going to use F here for fracture strength <coughs> for a brittle material, 
uh, the fracture strength was on the order of about 100 MPa, um, which is, that's for glass. But he knew theoretically from <coughs> the strength, or the, the amount of stress you have to apply to break the atomic bonds between glass, which had been done a while before, um, theoretically, theoretical, this should be closer to about 10,000 MPa. So he saw this discrepancy. He said, okay, well, theoretically, this is, this is supposed to be like two orders of magnitude higher str strengths than what we're seeing. So what's going on? So he did an experiment where he took a whole bunch of glass fibers and glass rods and added a scratch to them. So scratched, scratched glass rods. Specifically, he, so he took a rod and added some little scratch to it. And the length of that scratch was some length A. So we took these glass rods, kind of used some sort of a file to, to add a crack in, to add a scratch into it, and he found relative to the length of this crack, the the strength uh, of the material was proportional to the strength of failure was proportional to the square root of that crack length, of that scratch length proportional to, let's elongate that out just to make sure that it doesn't get confused with an A. Um, so he found that the, this fracture strength, that value, if he, if he made that scratch deeper and deeper, then this fracture strength decreased, but it specifically decreased relative to the square, or proportional to the square root of that A. And so more specifically, he kind of thought about this in terms of surface energy. So there was actually a specific formula that he had proposed where he said now uh, sigma f square root of a is approximately equal to some 2 e gamma over pi where e is the modulus and gamma is surface energy. So the way he logiced it, basically, was saying in order to create a crack, in order to cause a crack to form, I'm creating new surfaces. So, so if I open up a material and I take, a, take something that was solid and I make two new surfaces, the amount of energy that I dissipated in that process to create those two new surfaces is this energy here, that surface energy that I'm creating the crack, or that, I'm, that I'm creating my surfaces with. So my fracture strength here uh, is, is then equal to this quantity. And for the glass that he was using, E is about 62 GPA. Uh, surface energy is about, for glass, one joule per meter squared. Um, and he actually was able to predict pretty well uh, what the, the fracture, plugging in these values, he was able to predict pretty well what the fracture strength of glass would be, um, just using this uh, sort of empirically derived relationship. <coughs> so now kind of going back to where we are, uh, or we're going to make a slight detour. Um, so the I'm going to now define a material constant K1. So now in, instead of, oh, where do I want to go? Instead of thinking about this now, in terms of my maximum stress, I'm going to think about this in terms of, or in terms of a, a maximum stress in, in this form. I'm going to think about it in terms of a, a stress concentration factor, where specifically I'm going to define that stress concentration factor. K stress factor. K uh, is equal to sigma naught or sigma infinity square root of pi A. So now I'm going to take this relationship that we had here, that, that maximum stress comes uh, at, the, at the root of the notch, uh, and instead think about it now in terms of how that stress concentrates for a given crack length. So for this specifically, I'm going to ignore ignore my row. 
So I'm going to ignore uh, row. Um, so experimentally, it's it's pretty easy to see what the length of a crack is. You can say, all right, I can I can see this thing internally in a material. I can make a measurement on a microscope with a ruler with a whatever. But figuring out exactly what that row is is kind of difficult. So just you'd have to kind of go into the microscope, probably an electron microscope if it was a really fine crack, which of course they didn't have back in those days. Um, and even then, there's some ambiguity in terms of exactly what the radius is. So this is just a difficult quantity to figure out. So instead, we're only going to think about this in terms of the length of the crack, that length A. Um, and more, more specifically, when we talk about stress concentration factor, we're normally referring to the mode one stress concentration factor. So the remember there's those three shear, those three fracture modes. This is again the most common one for materials. So technically there's also a mode two and a mode three stress concentration factor, but for the most part we're just going to be thinking about this in terms of our mode one failure. So now we're ignoring that row in this formulation based on this idea that creating a crack or that causing a crack to propagate is creating some increased surface energy in the material. But is that okay? It, it seems a little bit weird to just kind of ignore part of what was giving our stress concentration before. So the short answer is yes and no. Um, it kind of depends. But historically now we can go back and there was a guy, uh, Irwin, G. Irwin, Erwin, he was in the, the Naval Research Lab in the United States in the 1950s. This was like World War II now. So this is World War II, um, like 1950s. And he was in Naval Research Lab and RL. And so him, he and his group uh, sort of thought about this now for general materials. So where Griffith was only thinking about glass rods, which are brittle materials, it turns out this, this relationship didn't really work as well when you tried to plug in other values for things like metals or, or polymers, things that were ductile. So Erwin came out and he said, well, let's think about the plasticity now around the crack tip. So I know that I'm never going to get something that's infinitely sharp, an atomically sharp crack in a material. Really, that crack is going to then blunt out. So instead of just looking at the crack itself, I'm going to think about now the, the plasticity field, plastic field, around the edge of that tip. Plastic. Um, this would be for plain stress. It looks something like that, which again, remember, is a thin sheet. Um, or for a different shape, uh, something kind of like this. It's not drawn terribly well here. Plain strain for a thick sheet. So now the this is the what the shape of the plastic deformation region looks like for different materials that are undergoing plain stress or plain strain. We'll go through that in a little bit more detail probably tomorrow, tomorrow Friday, probably on Friday. Um, but basically he then thought about, all right, realistically around this tip of the crack, you have some plastic deformation region. Um, so when I look at a crack, what I'm idealizing this crack as is some very sharp shape. It's never actually that. There's always some blunting of the crack um, because of the plastic region. Theoretically now, if I look at the stress, some distance r away from the root of the tip with some, uh, if I look at the magnitude of the stress, theoretically, remember, if I have an infinitely sharp crack, that stress goes to infinity. So it, it kind of goes up to infinity and then it would come down here and plateau. Um, I'm going to draw this with a dashed line instead. Theoretically, it kind of goes up here to infinity, 
and then comes down and, and plateaus to some far field stress that we're applying. But realistically, because of this plastic zone, I'm going to hit some yield strength of the material, some yield strength, and it's going to be plastically deforming around here, and then eventually it'll come back down to that far field. So this is the theoretical, theoretical that 1 over uh, sigma max is proportional to square root of a over rho, where rho now is the is the radius of our thing. So if I make that crack infinitely sharp, it kind of goes up to infinity. This is now the realistic, um, where you have with plasticity. So Erwin then proposed. Let's refocus this. Um, a slightly modified version of that fracture toughness relationship. So now we have a sigma <coughs> square root of a uh, instead is equal to e g over pi, where before I had a I had a two gamma uh, for the surface energy. This g now is going to be that surface energy term plus plastic dissipation energy. So um, tomorrow, I'll go, or tomorrow, Friday, I'll go into more detail about exactly how we get this G. But um, really simply, there's some energy that's dissipated plastically as I deform this crack. And as long as now, so long as G plastic is less than 2 gamma, or um, so long as my fracture process zone, as my fracture process zone is small relative to the part to part Griffith theory is valid. So basically what that means is now, if I have a part with a crack in it, I know there's going to be some plastic region around the edge, around the tip of that. This plastic region is going to have some radius, and this whole thing is going to have some width. So, as long as R is small relative to the width of my sample, then Griffith theory is valid. So what that fracture process looks like for different types of materials. Um, uh, Ten minutes. Okay, cool. So our three main classes of materials: metals, polymers, and, and ceramics. For metals, what this looks like around the edge of a crack tip um, is I have some plastic zone where things are just kind of plastic plastic zone uh, with some overall radius to R. Um, for polymers, instead I have something where it'll actually start to split at the edge of that tip. So I get a phenomenon known as crazing, which basically because polymers are, are the a polymer itself is chains of, of uh, chains of molecules held together. As I start to pull it, those will start pulling apart, and I'll get breaching of that polymer across the crack. <coughs> and so you'll get long strings of, of polymer bridging the tip of a crack, in a in a phenomenon known as crazing. Uh, for ceramics. around the tip of that crack there's a high stress. So what will actually start to happen is in that zone, in this sort of zone around here, I'll get micro cracking. Because remember, ceramics are intrinsically brittle. They always have some small cracks in internally in them. And so around the tip of a larger crack, I'll get micro cracking between the atoms and between um, 
in between different planes of, of atoms in there. Um, so in that region of high stress around the tip, I'll get microcarrying. But this this process zone now is bigger or smaller for different materials, and I'll, and I'll go through a little bit about later on about how big those process zones are. But basically, this si the size of this needs to be small relative to our part size in order to have a valid Griffith criteria fracture test. So there's a few different ways you can actually try to, um, a few different ways you can go about testing these things. One of the most common, uh, or there's, there's a couple that are fairly common. There's a double cantilever beam where you bring a long crack into a material. Cantilever beam where you then apply some force to uh, to a part that's basically glued together. So this is very common for something like uh, like composites where you have lamina glued together. You kind of pull those two lamina apart and you look at how it cracks. There's a compact tension specimen um, one. Do, do. Compact tension specimen where you drill holes. Compact tension where you drill holes and you pull on those holes um, to then cause a stress around here. There's um, a bending test. So this is this is sort of what you're doing in the Charpy test, except maybe with not a sharp crack. But if I apply a force now to a beam, so three point bend, then I'm getting a tensile force here around the tip of this and that'll cause that to then propagate through your material. Um, so there's there's a few different ways experimentally to, to test the, the fracture toughness. Technically now, so we, we defined some, some K1 as a stress concentration factor, some K1 stress concentration factor that's a function of geometry. Now, the question is, when, when does our material actually fail? So for that, we define <coughs> now a K1C is equal to just, just the K1 when failure happens. So K1C now, we're going to call our material property, so or a material property material property, uh, and this is from geometry. So what this means now for a given material, um, there's a couple ways to think about it, uh, but for, let's grab a new piece of paper. So if I, if I have a plate with a crack internally of length 2A and I'm applying some far field stress, some sigma infinity for, for constant crack length A, um, failure will happen, failure will happen when stress critical, stress infinity is equal to that critical stress, um, which is then K1C over square root of pi A. So if I know what the size of, of the cracks in my material are, what the biggest flaw is in my material, I know how much stress I'll have to apply to cause fracture to happen. And that is then a, a material property. Um, for a constant, for a constant uh, given applied stress, failure will happen when A critical one is equal to one over pi K one C over sigma infinity squared. So now this is, if I apply a certain stress, this is how big of a flaw I can have before my material will break. And so now that K1C varies material to material, and this kind of sets the limit of how, how big of a flaw I can have for a certain material size, 
or how much stress I can apply or sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Is that A sub C or sigma sub C? Which one? This one? Is this one? Uh, A sub C. Yeah. It's A sub C. There we go. Um, so now, to give you an idea of a few actual numbers of these things. Um, oh, right. Damn. I was going to. Um, real quick side note. So for for our metals polymers one, so I was going to pull this back in. Um, so around the tip of our aluminum, when the aluminum cracked, um, now you're probably not going to be able to see it very well at all. Nope, that's not really going to work. Um, I recommend you do this at home. But around the tip of that aluminum now, there'd be some plastic zone, uh, but you get a fairly clean fracture. Now around the tip of the paper instead, uh, which you're definitely not going to be able to see, Oh, super not going to be able to see. Nope. Nope. That's that's not going to work. Um, but if you rip a piece of paper, you'll notice a whole bunch of fibers and threads sticking out. And you'll notice that failure surface isn't as clean as the aluminum foil. And so that happens because papers, for, for those of you who don't know how paper is made, you take wood <coughs> pulp and you press it into a flat sheet. Um, so it's a whole bunch of tiny wood fibers that are then basically hot pressed together to make a mat. And so those fibers are then giving some internal texture, some basically some microstructure uh, that then causes fracture to move along a certain way. So that is again another example of how your the structure of the material changes how cracks will propagate. Um, anyway, so a couple examples of materials now. So material with a certain E and a certain KIC. So if we're looking at something like a ductile steel, our E is on the order of 200 GPA, and our fracture toughness, steels are pr fairly tough, is on the order of 170. Now the units for these are generally reported in MPA square root meter, um, because remember we're defining uh, wherever it was. Um, KIC now is our, our stress times the square root of A, where A is in meters. Um, so it's a weird unit, but that's this is generally how it's reported. Something like aluminum, so say 70, 75 aluminum has something on the order of 70 GPA and has a toughness around 29. Oh, damn. Something like soda lime glass, glass, would have a, uh, a stiffness on the order of 62 GPA, um, and it's very, very brittle, so it has a very low fracture toughness of something like 0 0.7. Um, and then something like an ABS polymer would have a fairly low stiffness of 1 GPA, but can still have a fairly high fracture toughness. So these two properties act independently. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll show on Friday an Ashby plot then of, of some of these different material properties and how it all breaks down. But, all right.